Clinic presents Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds. Welcome everyone to the November Grand Rounds episode of Always on EM, a podcast from the Mayo Clinic Department of Emergency Medicine. And I am Vank Bellamconda, an emergency physician and co-host of the show with my friend Alex Finch. We are thrilled to have you join us. And if you're joining for the first time, the middle of every month, we bring a Grand Rounds recording to share with you. And the first of every month, Alex and I usually dive into a topic with a content leader or thought leader. So please join us for all of these offerings, which you can find on any platform, you're obviously finding it now, but Apple, Spotify, uh, really any platform you want. We are a fledgling show on the landscape of podcasts and are so grateful that however you stumbled upon our show that you did and that you stay tuned in. So thank you for that. Today, we have a speaker talking about medical errors and the context in which they occur and how can we guide our way forward when they do happen. She is an incredible speaker and brings energy and vibrant discussion to every room she enters. Her visit recently to Rochester, Minnesota was really special, and she sparked ideas and amazing dialogue the whole time. If you are in a position to engage speakers for your department, thought leaders for your department, I 100% recommend that you reach out to Dr. Heather Murray. Before I give her the floor, a couple notes. As always, we appreciate when you take the time to leave a comment, like, and subscribe to our show. It really helps. Also, I want to point out that she begins her talk and her first slide has the words, quote, do you remember that patient, dot, 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 end quote. It will help set the stage for what she is talking about when she gets going. You'll see. Finally, Alex and I want to wish each and every one of you who choose to observe a very happy Thanksgiving holiday. We are incredibly grateful for you being a part of our podcasting journey. It's been a trip and we continue to derive so much satisfaction from it. So thank you. Okay. Without any more delay, let me give her a more formal introduction. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Heather Murray. Dr. Murray has been an attending physician at Queens University for 26 years. She holds the rank of professor in emergency medicine and public health sciences at Queens. In addition to completing specialty training in emergency medicine, she has a master's degree in clinical epidemiology, has completed a research fellowship from the Ottawa Health Research Institute, and she holds a certificate from the Harvard Macy Program for Educators and Health Professions. A passionate and innovative educator, she is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Chancellor Charles Bailey Award for Outstanding Teaching, given at Queen's University, and she has developed learning events and curriculum for students, residents, practicing attendings on a variety of topics, from evidence-based medicine, critical appraisal of the literature, and of course, on clinical errors. She's held several leadership roles in her career, including serving as deputy editor of Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine and is currently a senior associate editor at the Canadian Medical Association Journal. More recently, she has dived headfirst into working on understanding medical errors and serves as a physician advisor for safe medical care learning with the Canadian Medical Protective Association. For these and many more reasons, we are very thrilled to have her present on medical errors in emergency medicine. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've super enjoyed uh, touring your beautiful and amazingly quiet emergency department. I've never experienced such like lack of, of auditory assault in a, in a Canadian emergency department. So, um, yeah, I have a few disclosures. I am a, an editor at the Canadian Medical Association Journal, which is Canada's JAMA. It's a little smaller, a little lower impact factor, but, uh, It's important to us. Uh, I'm a speaker for emergency medicine and acute care. And as mentioned, I'm a physician advisor for the Canadian Medical Protective Association. But this talk is me and not them. So uh, I want you just to sit for a minute and think about how you feel when someone says that to you, because nobody ever wants to hear this in emergency medicine. And I actually think we should ban those words, right? Like like people will sometimes come and go, oh, remember that patient? And like, I'll have all my usual responses where my heart rate goes up and I have chest pain, and I'm like breathing shallowly, and I'm like cycling through all the people I've seen in the last two weeks to think of like who I'm being talked to about. And they're like, oh yeah, that guy wanted to say thanks so much. And you're just like, never, never start with remember that patient, because immediately I feel sure that I have made some kind of catastrophic error. And I think it's a good way to start to think about this, because errors are deeply personal. Uh, They challenge our identity as good doctors. They are not what we came into medicine to do. And 
And it's really hard to sort of sit with the discomfort of believing that you have caused harm to somebody in an environment um, like the emergency department. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of a journey through a landscape. So I wanna give you just a bird's eye view of the concepts that I think are important to think about when we talk about diagnostic error. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the aftermath of error. We're gonna talk about some individual strategies and we're gonna talk about some um, system-based strategies that we can maybe use to prevent errors going forward. So this talk begins <laughs> in December of 2022 when the AHRQ released a systematic review called Diagnostic Errors uh, in the Emergency Department. And this is a weighty tome. It's 744 pages long. They uh, put a huge net out and gathered up just every piece of evidence that you can imagine to look at diagnostic error in the emergency department. Um, and there is a lot of good in this document, but there is also some provocative stuff that has, uh, that has caused some issues. So what did they wanna do? Well, they wanted to find out what are the most frequent misses that are associated with harm. So frequent and severe, right? So they wanted to understand what the frequency of conditions that are associated with error are. They wanted to try to create a point estimate, like what is the overall rate of error, what is the rate of harm, and what is the rate of death from emergency department misdiagnosis. And then they wanted to try to look at some associated causal factors. So what they discovered, uh, I'm going to jump to the methods afterwards, which is a little bit non-evidence-based medicine, but we'll start with the results because that's kind of what hit the headlines. There is a 5.7% misdiagnosis rate, said the pooled estimate of the systematic review. So a little more frequent than one in 20 emergency department visits ended in misdiagnosis was their conclusion. They concluded that of all emergency department visits in uh, the US, so this was their extrapolation, 2% of them result in harm and 0.3% in serious harm to patients that come and see us for care. And 0.2% uh, of patients seen in the emergency department overall were, uh, had their deaths attributed to misdiagnosis in, in these point estimates. And so you can imagine how that hit the news waves because if we extrapolate 0.2% and multiply by the number of emergency department visits in the US, we get quite a body pile. Uh, and that's kind of what made it to the news, right? People started going like, oh my God, you know, you are likely to be misdiagnosed, you are likely to die, like, and, and, and this was <clears throat> considered newsworthy. So I will say that the, the report says that we are really good at this. We are really good at taking undifferentiated patients and figuring out what is wrong with them. We're actually astonishingly good at it, but we are not perfect. And, and they made the comment that the fact that this number isn't higher is actually a, a tribute to the skill of emergency doctors. That did not make the headline. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, every academic uh, and leadership organization associated with emergency medicine in the US kind of went nuts and they wrote a letter very quickly denouncing the methods of this systematic review. And, and I think, you know, it is unfortunate because the nuance doesn't hit the headlines, the body count hits the headlines. And, and so it was a lost opportunity for maybe a more, a more nuanced conversation. Uh, there was a podcast from ASAP where they basically talk about all of the errors in methodology of this report. And finally, uh, some guy named Chris Carpenter uh, wrote uh, a critical appraisal that was published. Hey, he just left. <laughs> but he, he had a research meeting. <laughs> or maybe he knew. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a really thoughtful piece of work, actually. And what he does is he unpacks all of the methodologic errors in this systematic review. And, and there is a lot of problems with like casting a big net and piecing a bunch of things together. For example, how we define error sounds simple, right? It's misdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis, or wrong diagnosis. That seems easy, except missing an aortic dissection and having somebody go home chest pain NYD and dropping dead is not the same as, I think you have gastro, you know, maybe you have appendicitis, two days later, your pain migrates to the right lower quadrant, you develop an overt fever, and yes, you are diagnosed with appendicitis. That looks like misdiagnosis, but is it? And then a missed nodule on a chest x-ray, when a patient has actually come for cough or shortness of breath, is not actually a missed diagnosis. It's a, it's a problem with test follow-up and, and a QI issue. 
So when you try to merge all of these things together, you have an uncomfortable sort of a uh, collection of things that maybe don't match, like apples, oranges, papayas, you know, kiwis, I don't know, a, a lot of things that maybe aren't quite the same. Some of the other things, the actual point estimate is extrapolated from three separate small studies. One of them was Canadian, one of them was from Europe. And so this large point estimate comes from actually a small number of studies, because it turns out that a lot of the error papers are, are numerator only. They are like analyses of malpractice actions or um, complaints to regulatory bodies. So they don't have a denominator and you can't figure out how common this actually is. And some of the issues that we see in pooled analyses of closed claims or complaints to regulatory bodies are probably fundamentally different from the cases that had the same outcome that didn't make it up into a lawsuit or a complaint. And so there's a selection bias, there's some difference in opinion. So, so you can start to see some of the problems in creating these point estimates and in, and in pooling all of this together. And that's a lot of what made the emergency medicine bodies annoyed and uh, what led to some of the critical appraisal elements because there is a lot of challenge in trying to study diagnostic error. In February, um, the JAMA editorial, this JAMA editorial was published. I'll, I'll just let you read the quote this is Venk jumping in. She has a slide that is from JAMA 2023 by Dr. Jonathan Edlow and Dr. Peter Pronovost. And the quote says, the healthcare profession needs to accept that physicians, being human, are fallible. Systems of care to reduce diagnostic errors to a minimum must be designed. So this is a really thoughtful editorial. And what it said was, yes, there are lots of methodologic issues with that systematic review, but there is a lot of good in this as well. And there are some useful things that we can take away. So number one, we need to talk about diagnostic error. We need to talk about it. It is mostly invisible. It is not well studied. We need to really sit down and think about how can we design systems that catch error in a way that is perhaps more valid and, and accurate than, than some of the methodology that's been used before. And we need systems and system level innovations in order to reduce the numbers of error. And so basically they're like, look, this estimate of 5.7%, you know, you can quibble with it. There is methodologic challenges in how it came up, but it's actually not far off from some of the estimates of error rates in other specialties. So the error rate in family medicine, for example, is shown to be about 6%. There are some studies that have looked at autopsy results for hospitalized patients, and it's shown that between 8 and 10% of the autopsies show that the working diagnosis of the patients in hospital was incorrect. So, so the rate is something. It is certainly not zero, right? These errors are happening. We are making mistakes. How do we get better? Where do we go from here? And so how can we use the information is perhaps a better question. And I think there is some useful stuff. So one of the things is that 15 conditions showed up as causing more than two thirds of the errors in the report. And if you take 10 seconds, what do you think is on the list? Yeah, yeah. so chest pain causing, you know, like, like what do you think is coming up there? I mean, miss MI, dissection, the aorta. So I have a colleague in Canada, he gives a talk called the aorta will screw you up, only screw is not the verb that he uses. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so aortic dissection, aortic ruptured aortic aneurysm, like those are, yeah, absolutely. So the things that you would expect are on this list are on the list. Here's the top five, stroke, MI, the aorta, spinal cord compression and injury. So this is another thing with this study. They, they sometimes merge things together that seem a bit weird. So traumatic spinal cord injury is living alongside with cauda equina. Um, which is like a little bit weird, but, you know, we'll just go with it. Venous thromboembolism, our good friend pulmonary embolism, right? <laughs> like medical students sometimes ask me, like, how does pulmonary embolism, how does pulmonary embolism present? And I'm like, have you got three hours? Because basically anything, it can be a PE in my experience. <laughs> so uh, meningitis, encephalitis, sepsis tied for sixth, lung cancer. So here we have, again, I don't think our diagnostic error, but uh, definitely a, a system-wide problem in identifying incidental findings that are important to patients, pa very patient relevant, but perhaps aren't our uh, cognitive errors. Uh, trauma, arterial thromboembolism, the 
elusive spinal cord abscess, which you'll be amazed to know the standard of care there is to miss it probably twice. Okay, <laughs> so 56% false negative rate, 56% uh, miss rate for spinal cord abscess uh, when it shows up in emergency departments. Um, so, so do those conditions feel right to you? That kind of feels like it's a decent list. That has face validity to me. That feels like it is, yeah. Over and over again. Yeah, yeah. So this, I think, is a really useful launching platform for us to say, okay, let's start by looking at these. This is two thirds of our errors, more than. Let's start by looking at them and, and see where we can go from there. Uh, there was a couple of other findings in the report. Uh, one of them is that clinicians don't miss diagnoses when they are obvious. And I'm here to say that seems obvious, right? Like we don't miss things that are obvious. <laughs> so, so perhaps that's less helpful. Uh, they sort of identify some of the things that we probably could have written down on a napkin, uh, that we miss things when they're rare, right? How many of us can say right off the top of our heads how Lambert-Eaton syndrome presents or uh, what hereditary angioedema looks like? or familial Mediterranean fever. Other than the fever part, who can enlist the diagnostic? Uh, I mean, we can't, because they're astonishingly rare. We don't see them that often. Um, subtle symptoms, atypical symptoms, I would have said also early in a disease course is another uh, feature. Okay, so we've toured the systematic review and we've looked at what we think might not be uh, optimal uh, methodology. Let's talk about the aftermath of an error, because I actually think the most important part of medical error is making sure that we support the clinicians who are involved with it after the fact. And for a lot of my career, and I've been around a long time, we weren't very good at this. We weren't very good at acknowledging and supporting people in the aftermath of error because it can be soul destroying. So I am happy to sit down with you and tell you some stories of some things that I have missed. I am not proud of them. They were not my best moments, but, uh, you know, I think it is important to have these conversations. And the sad reality is that we are, most of us in our career, going to make errors. And we hope that our medical misdiagnoses will not be serious, that we give safe discharge advice, that we have safety nets for patients so that we can catch them uh, before serious harm occurs. But if you are unfortunate enough to be on the causing end of serious patient harm, that is an awful thing. And so I think uh, the first thing that I would say is you are not alone. This is a shared experience and something that we can talk about together, I think, and, and hopefully safely. I have a colleague in Canada. Her name is, uh, is Sarah Gray, and she coined this term failure friends. And she has this idea that you should have a collection of people with whom you can talk non-judgmentally. You can, you can say, here's you know, what I did and, and, and have a, a safe, supportive conversation. And so I, I'm here to tell you, I actually have failure friends for parenting. Uh, you can have relationship failure friends. And uh, so I think I would definitely recommend medical failure friends as part of a recovery process and, and as part of something that you can do after an error. Um, you have a peer support program. You have a really excellent peer support program here at the Mayo Clinic. And this is an innovation that has emerged probably in the last decade. And the idea here is confidential support from people who understand what your job is that can be triggered either by you or by someone who is worried about you. And so the advent of formal peer supports, I would say, please remember they are there and please don't be afraid to use them. In some other professions, there is an acknowledgement that when you are involved in something traumatic, you should be pulled off the front lines. So police officers who shoot someone do not go back to work the next day. They are pulled off and they're not pulled off because they did something wrong or they are terrible police officers. They were pulled off because it is traumatic to shoot someone and it is acknowledged that you need some time to recover. You need to be debriefed and you need to get back in the game again. And the same thing is true for airline pilots who have near misses. And I think we've been slow to recognize, you know, we have this kind of superhuman thing where it's like, well, I'll just go work my shift tomorrow, I guess. You know, not that I'm super traumatized because the person I sent home with chest pain had an aortic dissection and died, but I'm sure I'll provide great care the next shift that I go to work. And it turns out when you ask doctors in 2010, almost all of them asked for this ability, the ability to be deployed to something maybe non-clinical, maybe do some lookups, maybe do some teaching. Um, internal support, which we now have pretty much in, in, in most centers, that sort of peer support program and expedited external supports as it's needed. 
Uh, in one uh, institution, this is in St. Louis, I think. Do you say St. Louis? Saint Louis? C'est Saint Louis? <laughs> no, no, St. Louis. Okay, St. <laughs> Louis. I'll try. I do offer simultaneous translation for my accent if, uh, if that's uh, problematic. So uh, after they instituted this uh, stepwise process, what they found was 60% of people did fine with passive, I would call it passive peer support. So the peer support was there. People could go out and, and reach out to them if they need it or not. 60% of people, that was all they need, needed after a traumatic adverse event. Um, and they included errors or, you know, substantially upsetting, uh, you know, child death, things like that. Uh, another 30% got the tap on the shoulder, which was, hey, you know, some people have said they're worried about you and the peer support is actively reaching out to you. And another 10% actually used uh, external resources for, for support and help. And I think this is one of the best things we've seen in medicine in the last little while is the acknowledgement that, you know what, it's okay to go get some external counseling when you've been involved in something terrible. Uh, and you may not need it for long, but, but acknowledging that is really important. There's lots of barriers to accessing support. Um, availability of resources has to do, in Canada right now, we have a, a huge shortage of emergency doctors and of emergency nurses. And so having resources to actually be protected from being on, you know, to be taken off your shifts for a little while is becoming an increasing problem. So, so that's one of the big barriers. I do want to say something specific about learners because it can be much harder for learners to access peer support programs because they are concerned that the people involved in peer support are responsible for moving them through and graduating them from their learning program. And so it is really important that you have structures in place to make sure that learners understand that the people that they can reach out to are in no way responsible for their movement through a program. Uh, and, and I think uh, I just can't stress that enough. Okay, so I'm gonna recap that one little bit. The aftermath is hard. I think it's important to find support, institutional processes like your peer support program and, uh, and think hard about your learners. Okay, let's go to some individual stuff. So individual interventions ultimately are not going to move the needle on that 5.7% if that is what it is. Okay, let's just assume it's 5.7%. Individual approaches are probably not going to change that, right? Uh, the thing that will, that will move the needle is those system-based approaches. And I would put it to you that if you can prevent yourself from making one bad error, that is going to have a big impact on you. So it is actually worth spending a little bit of time talking about individual interventions, even though probably those aren't gonna make the big number changes that we would like to see in this, in this issue. So what's the first strategy? Well, it's situational awareness and mindfulness. And I know you were expecting me to say something way more like evidency or science-y, but this is actually super important. Uh, this is my favorite cartoon. <laughs> because I think it just really encapsulates what cognitive overload looks like. <laughs> like, like who feels like that in the middle of a shift when you have 17 people who are 80 and you know, something is blaring and a phone is ringing and you're, yeah, this, this, this is what that looks like to me. So uh, this is Canada. <clears throat> On the left, that's a newspaper article. So uh, that's kind of, this is a common site in Canada now is, uh, is our hallway medicine. Uh, I think that came, came from Ottawa. On the right is, um, that's my ambulance bay. <laughs> and this is what you see when you're getting your scrubs for the shift, okay? So like, that, the scrub dispenser's there and then you're like looking over the bay. So imagine how you feel as you come in on a beautiful sunny day in Kingston, you go like, oh my God, <laughs> great. Okay, so noise, distraction, external pressures, crowded waiting rooms, all of those things impair your thinking. Uh, and cause some of that cognitive overload, uh, you know, scribbling. One of the things that it took me a long time to recognize and get good at managing is my emotional response to a patient. When someone is really angry at you, you are biologically wired to become angry back, right? Like that is your response. It's, it's called emotional mirroring, right? When someone gets angry, you get angry. And being able to step back from that and kind of go, whoa, I'm really getting angry here. I need to take a minute and walk away. That is a really important thing to be able to recognize. And I have definitely made some errors uh, when I have been frustrated with people or annoyed with people and I haven't listened carefully to the information that is coming to me. 
Um, and so I think recognizing your own emotional response to people, having that mindfulness to say, I am getting angry. I need to walk out of the room and take a minute to kind of reset myself and get in a better headspace. Who feels like this at the end of a shift? <laughs> like you just need to get out, but you've got 17 tasks and six charts and yeah. So end of the shift or the time of day can really influence your, your cognitive decision-making. I love this uh, mnemonic. Are you hungry, angry, late, or tired? Another thing that distracts you from, I would say, cognitive hygiene, which is a term I've just made up, but I really like it. Um, so I would argue that you have all of the halt elements at the end of your shift, right? Like you have all of those things and um, your thinking may not be the best. So probably one of the number one things that we can do to stop ourselves from making error is engaging in a little bit of self-care on shift. I have an astonishing ability to not notice when I have to go to the bathroom, to not notice when I am hungry, to continue working for many hours after I first notice that I have to go to the bathroom, suppress it and continue on. That is called a complete lack of mind-body awareness, right? I have trained myself to completely pay no attention to a lot of the things that are going on with my body during shifts because I have this sense that I have to keep going. I have to see more and more patients. And, and I think that training ourselves to recognize when our bodies are not functioning optimally is actually freeing up probably a little bit of unconscious brain space to do the things that you need to do. Your brain is what you need working really well on your shift in the emergency department. And you can help it by eating, taking breaks, going to the bathroom, <laughs> uh, you know, caring for yourself, like just a little bit of basic human care. I'm not talking about having a spa day in the middle of the department or, you know, lifting weights or something. This is just like basic care. I think another useful way that you can channel this is when you recognize. So mindfulness is about being aware of the way that you think, being aware of where you are and what you're doing. And when you recognize, you know what, I'm frustrated with this patient. I don't know what's going on. Or maybe my decision making is not great right now. It is four in the morning. I'm very tired. I didn't have my pre-shift nap and I am just like not sorting this out. Take yourself somewhere where there aren't distractions. Give yourself a proper break. And there is actually some evidence that suggests you can reset and improve your cognition just by taking a moment uh, away. And I'll also say that this is also a time where you can use your charting, your uh, documentation process to help you through your thinking. Good charts don't only just reflect the care that was provided, they reflect the thinking that went into that care. And if you are putting your clinical reasoning in the chart, you know, I think this person has gastroenteritis, but they don't have diarrhea, but I don't think it's appendicitis because they aren't tender in the right lower quadrant, their weight count's normal, like all of those things. Then the person who sees that person two days later is going to see what your thinking was, why what you did made sense at the time. And it's a gift to the people downstream. It's a communication tool. And so that's another way where you can use your charting to help you through maybe some opportunities uh, or some, some instances when you aren't thinking properly. Uh, a quick shout out, how many of you have heard of this place in the other Rochester, Rochester, New York? So there's a guy named Ron Epstein uh, out of Rochester, New York, and they run this program called Mindful Practice in Medicine. They do a half day online workshop and they also do some retreats. I took it with a high degree of skepticism. You know, I was like, oh, I'm bulletproof, man. I'm an emerge doc, I've done this for 30 years. Like, oh, mindfulness. I, I, I found this actually kind of transformative. Okay, like it, like it was really opened up my eyes to a lot of some of the things that can help me be calmer, be more connected with myself and work better in my shifts. And they actually have a pile of evidence around how mindful practice has better patient outcomes, has higher satisfaction and career longevity. So it's, it's worth checking them out. I think they have a lot of interesting things to say. Okay, individual strategy two on our whirlwind tour of diagnostic error is cognitive biases. So um, this is an interesting study. So by the way, that QR code at the beginning is going to show up at the end again, and that links to my reference document. So all of the I have all of the references available for you to download. Um, and if that QR code isn't working for you, I will also send it to Sue just so that she has a copy. So um, yeah, this study was published in 2022, and it's kind of a cool study. What they did was they went to a bunch of conferences in Japan. And they asked the physicians there, okay, think about your worst error or a, an error that you remember really well. 
And now I want you to reflect on what happened. And we're going to give you a cheat sheet on cognitive biases. We're going to teach you all about these cognitive biases. And we want you to, we want you to, uh, to identify which ones might have been involved in this error. And so what they found was that there was about three cognitive biases that people identified in each one of these errors. The emergency department was the most common setting. So these weren't all emergency physicians. Some of them were surgeons who came to the emergency department to see patients or internists who came to the emergency department to see patients. And so the, the common thing there is the emergency department, which is kind of a learning lab for error because that's where undifferentiated patients live. Not surprisingly, night shifts were the most common times that people made these errors. And so this was kind of an interesting study that really just looked at how people perceived their errors and how they identified that they actually made a lot of these cognitive bias errors, uh, diagnostic heuristic errors when they were going through patients. So take a minute and read that triage note. Venk jumping in. She has a slide that says anchoring bias, triage note, 19 year old female college student with fever and headache. Roommates recently all had COVID. Tested negative this morning. Heart rate 110. Temperature 38.4. Blood pressure 98 over 50. Oxygen saturation 96%. So anchoring bias is this bias that occurs when you latch onto an early piece of information and you just fail to deviate from it. So you latch onto the idea that she has COVID, the false negative test is false negative, it's COVID, and you stop paying attention to the other pieces of information that come in. It has a close relative, which is called premature closure, uh, where again, you, you lock onto a diagnosis a little bit too early and you fail to consider other things. So I'm only gonna talk about anchoring bias. There are a lot of these cognitive biases. Probably they go hand in hand with situational factors like noise and distraction and fatigue. And probably they also go hand in hand with some other stressors, crowding and, and so forth, but they exist if we can parse them out of a lot of these cases and, and, and they exist as, as uh, part of our error process. So it turns out that there are some structured strategies that you can use. They're called cognitive forcing strategies. And there are some for each one of these errors. I, I'm pointing it out for anchoring because it's the most common one. The two things that you can do are things that we normally do for uh, medical students when we're teaching, right? I and mean, it's like, okay, you think this person has pneumonia? What else could it be? Let's broaden our differential out a little bit. Okay, so, so uh, forcing yourself to broaden out and consider some other things. And the other thing is challenging yourself. What in this piece of information doesn't fit? What doesn't fit? And if you teach medical students, these are two really useful questions that you can use to probe the clinical reasoning processes of the medical students that, that work with you. The other piece of this that I think is important is to um, communicate uncertainty in your assessment, both to the patient or if you're handing someone over it to, to your colleague at handover. So when I receive handover, I always want to receive like a very nicely packaged, easy, quick problem. And sometimes I, I am sold a bill of goods <laughs> because I'm told that it's an easy, quick problem and it's just a CT and it's gonna show renal colic and it's all gonna be fine. And then it isn't. <laughs> I would argue that although I want to hear that on the receiving end, it's probably better for patient care and for collegiality to be upfront with the goods, right? I don't really understand what's happening with this patient. I'm flailing around with the donut of truth, the CT scanner, in the hopes that something happens and I'm running away from the, from the department. So, <laughs> I mean, that's an exaggeration, obviously, but I think communicate your uncertainty. When you aren't sure that something is something, don't tell the person you're handing over to that you think this is a thing because it, it, it does lead to, some, to some, uh, some straying, if you will. Okay, individual strategy two, who is your team? And so, oh, three, sorry, we're already at three. Uh, so I wanna just take a minute, literally a minute, to talk a little bit about teamwork, because I think that leveraging your team is another safety net that can stop you from, from making errors. So a big part of teamwork is this concept of psychological safety. And so I would ask you, who would you rather approach here if you wanted to tell them something that might not be well received? <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm gonna call him, I don't know, a neurosurgeon. And this is, I don't know, a pediatrician. Like I'm just, I'm just spitballing who those people might be. 
So psychological safety is a little bit about approachability. What it actually is, is the freedom that your team has to deliver to you an unpopular opinion. Okay, psychological safety is whether your team feels comfortable taking interpersonal risks, right? Can they tell you that they think you are not doing something that you should, that, you know, or, or that you should be doing something that you're not doing? Can they challenge your dose in a resuscitation? Can they, can they introduce an idea to you that you might not want to hear? It's, it's really important and it's an essential part of having safe functioning teams. And our simulation people know this. Our simulation people work in this kind of environment all the time to try to build that team function, those relationships and that, and that uh, back and forth. So I want you to read this uh, just for a minute, the impression of the consultant and the impression of the junior nurse. On the slide, the consultant quote, emergency is a forward thinking specialty where the traditional medical hierarchy is recognized as outdated. This department embraces this movement and staff are treated as equals on the team. The junior nurse quote, arrogant doctors are the biggest barrier in most situations. Some doctors need to be reminded that nurses are still people. We're on the same team and to be respectful. So this is work from my very good friend, Eve Purdy, who is an emergency physician and anthropologist in Australia. And she is just uncovering kind of team dynamic things. And so what I want to just show you here is a little bit the intention impact gap, right? You may perceive that you are the puppy dog that is super approachable, but your team may not find you that way. And so it's worth thinking about what do you do explicitly on a shift to encourage the people around you to approach you if they are concerned about something? And is there something that you could do going forward that might Im that might improve that, right? So, so, so maybe you're unaware of how you're perceived. Maybe people are a little bit frightened of you or intimidated by you because you're so smart. Uh, and so, so what can you do? You know, can can you ask them? to, you know, please come and tell me if vital signs change, or, or can you please let me know if, if you see me doing something that's worrisome, or, you know, a pre-shift huddle is a good time to introduce the idea that you are open to challenging feedback. And the better and more open you are to challenging feedback, the more your team can help you stop from making an error. So uh, we're thinking about how can your team help you? And with that, I'm gonna recap. So we've talked about situational awareness and mindfulness. We've talked about cognitive forcing and particularly around anchoring bias. And we've talked about enhancing teamwork. So I wanna to go to some system things. So the first system strategy is program level feedback. So just as we may be suspicious of this 5.7% point estimate, do you know what your own local number is, right? What's your overall pooled miss rate for those 15 conditions? Because once you know what your, what your baseline is, then you've got a number that you can move from. You know where the needle is and you know how to work on trying to get it down. So it is always better to learn from other people's mistakes than your own. And programmatic feedback allows you the opportunity to do that. So one of the things this report recommends is using something called symptom disease pair analysis of diagnostic error. So that's a bit of a mouthful. They've shortened it to be called SPADE. But basically all it is, is what we do when we're looking at a particular condition. So you say to yourself, hey, how many aortic dissections have we missed? So you go look up all the aortic, aortic dissections in your institution over X period of time, and you look back to see how many of them had multiple visits, how many of them were missed. And then you look to see if there are commonalities around the misses so that it's not an individual retrospective look at one patient. It's a pool look that says, you know what? A lot of people who come in with aortic dissection have X or Y. And then you can do education around some of those commonalities and you have some strategies that you can employ to move that needle. So this spade methodology is something that they recommend. And I think that that list of 15 is a good place to start to, uh, to try to figure out what's going on in your own institution on these target, um, target conditions. I think that M&M rounds are a nice place to do some education around commonalities, to bring important lessons from a single case, ideally a representative case, and disseminate it out. And I know that you do a pretty robust M&M process. We use something called the Ottawa M&M model, and I don't wanna go into it in detail because you're all familiar, 
with M&M as a concept. The one thing I want to point out is that the Ottawa M&M model does put a focus on making sure that there are tangible takeaways. So every M&M has an action item or two that go out, whether that action item is educationally based or maybe there's a pop up in your in your uh, in your epic, something actionable and tangible and and much more so if there's if perceived to be a, a safety threat. So that's a, a structure that's that's um, that's helpful. And this is kind of using M&M as an opportunity to educate around the commonalities that you see with some of the some of the misses that are that are, I think, generalizable to a larger to a larger number of cases than just the one. Okay, second diagnostic strategy. And this, again, is something we probably already know how to do. And it's about when you find that you have problems with one particular presentation or diagnosis, then you can build in particular pathways. You can build in the use of decision tools, cognitive aids. You can build strategic processes to help you prevent error. So as an example, in our center, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work on stroke, uh, which is still one of the most missed uh, diagnoses. And it turns out there are typical, atypical presentations for stroke, right? And so we don't miss obvious presentations, so we don't miss unilateral weakness. But dizziness is a trickier one. Headache is an atypical symptom. Children with stroke quite frequently missed uh, or, or take a while to figure out what's going on, particularly if some of the findings are subtle. Uh, and so, so if you have atypical patients, that tends to be a problem. Some people don't know about negative CTs, so maybe that's a commonality that gets found when you look at a large collection of these. Hey, we were misled by negative CTs, you know, six times in this collection of cases. Then that's a that's a launch pad for some for some education. So in our center, we use the Canadian TIA score, uh, which is a a, a pathway sort of. Uh, triaging urgency score. So it tells you who needs to be admitted, who can be uh, followed up uh, very rapidly and who can go for a routine follow-up. And uh, and so we use system level pathways. We have this embedded decision uh, support tools. We have rapid access. So we have bypass systems. And I'm sure you have similar things uh, for acute strokes and embedded stroke expertise. So part of your team is also consultants who are distant from the emergency department. And, and getting their involvement in structuring some of these pathways can, can help with error management. I, I don't think any of that is revolutionary, but it's just an example of instead of just deciding to do a care pathway, it's, it's a structured process of identify which of these you know, target conditions are problematic, set your number, it, like it's a QI process, right? <laughs> Build a structured pathway, get uh, institutional buy-in, create a barrier-free kind of route for, for these patients and then look to see if you can improve your, your diagnostic acumen. Okay, this is the thing that I'm most excited about and I wanna spend the most time on because I think it's gonna, I think this is gonna revolutionize medical practice like nothing I have seen in 30 years of practice. And that is the use of AI. So already there are applications. So this generative AI, the chat GPT has just burst onto the scene as you know. It is already in use. There are many commercial applications that are being used in Canada, and I'm pretty sure in the US as well, for charting. And so uh, on my reference list, there is some New England Journal of Medicine uh, articles that, that go through this, and they provide examples of what the chatbot does. And so what it does is, let's say I go in to see a patient who has, I don't know, back pain, right? So I get their consent, I push record, and the entire interview is transcribed. So there's a there's a recording, word for word recording of the entire interview, and then I'm going to verbalize my findings. Okay, you know, there's some tenderness at the SI joint or whatever I say. It's all verbalized. So you have a transcript, and then you say to the chatbot, generate a note. And it takes your transcript and turns it into a note that that summarizes the clinical encounter. And so the people who are using this, the Canadian physicians who are using this, we don't have it in an emergency department that I'm aware of, but I think it is coming. You want to? Okay, okay. So, so the people who use this are like tearfully reporting how their life has changed. They've gotten hours back in their day, right? Imagine never having to chart again. It's just recorded and then your note gets spit out. 
you do have to review the transcript, right? <laughs> like, and, and there are a few weird things like sometimes, and I'll talk about this later a little bit, sometimes the AI just makes stuff up. And in the example that they give, they show the transcript and then in the note, the AI just like added in this physical exam finding that he didn't do, that he didn't say it. Like it just like this, this finding just appeared that kind of matched with the story. And so, so they talk about some strategies to manage this. And one of the strategies you can actually tell it, have you put anything in there that's not right? And if you can challenge it to check its own thinking and it goes, yeah, yeah, I, I, I did throw that in. Like, it's like, I, I mean, I'm kind of making a joke about it, but, but there is this process. And so I think there's a, a learning curve to figuring out how this works and how to keep it accurate. But imagine being able to see a patient and having your note already generated and it's showing you everything that you said in the encounter. So it's actually stopping you from anchoring because it's not letting you ignore some of the things that you heard because you think someone has COVID. It's, it's sucking them in. So I, I throw it out there as a possible application that I think is going to be really interesting. Okay. <laughs> In 2023, this thing got published in JAMA Internal Medicine, and I think it's really cool. So there is a Reddit thread called Ask a Doctor. I don't know why doctors go to this thread and answer questions. Like, I, I, I have no, like, I answer enough questions in my day to day. I do not need to do it on a Reddit forum for free. Like, like well, we, I don't know that we know that they're doctors. But anyway, it's a Reddit thread. It's called Ask a Doctor. So what they did is they took these queries for the Reddit thread and they said, you know, hey, chat GPT, answer these queries. And the chat GPT generated responses and 80% of the people who read the responses preferred the chatbot response because it was more empathetic and it was more complete. So I don't know about the gold standard of doctors on Reddit, right? But it's kind of a cool idea. One of the examples that they had there was like somebody who said, hey, I swallowed a toothpick. Should I be worried? And the doctor's like, no, you're fine. If you get belly pain, you know, go see someone. But most toothpicks just pass, right? <laughs> Whereas the chapel was like, I'm so sorry that you swallowed a toothpick. How stressful. <laughs> so, you know, like, like it's just it's sort of longer, you know, and then it kind of detailed, you know, were you to develop a bowel obstruction? Here is the symptoms that you could watch. for. Like, is it just more complete, more uh, nuanced kind of summary as opposed to like, you know, if you get belly pain, you know, get worried. So where I think this could be an interesting application is in a discharge summary that is personalized to the patient. So we have all these standard discharge summaries. Here's your standard head injury discharge summary. If you have a seizure, come back to the emergency department. I have never thought that that is useful. You know, like they list a list of things that should make you come back. You've had a concussion. You know, we don't think you have a serious brain injury. Here's all the things you should watch for. You know, like you can't move your arm. You have a seizure. <laughs> like, like all of these fairly obvious symptoms that would cause someone to come back to the emergency department. But maybe if you could do a discharge note that was personalized to the patient. So it's like, hey, ChatGPT, give this note to, you know, Anna and tell her that I think she has gastro, but it's weird that she doesn't have diarrhea. And here's the symptoms she needs to watch for for appendicitis. And you get this personalized summary that's, that's comprehensive and a little bit more nuanced. So it enhances our ability to maybe do some safe discharge. So that's another potential application that I think is interesting. Differential diagnosis generation. So for decades, we have pinned our hopes on the computers to tell us when to suspect something super rare like selenium toxicity. I have no idea how selenium toxicity presents. I don't think I would recognize it if it jumped up in front of me and said, hey, there might be too much selenium here. I, I'm not sure even then that I could piece that together, but maybe the computer is like, have you thought of selenium toxicity? It's like, well, no, but I will. So the problem is the computers have not been good enough up until now, right? Uh, there's this famous cartoon of a person with an arrow in their stomach, and it's like the computer says you have gallstones, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, which is funny, but it, but it's like the the algorithms have not been sophisticated enough. But now with this large machine learning opportunity, there is maybe the potential to really hone in on this differential diagnosis and solve the knowledge rare disease problem. Right, like maybe the chat GPT can remind me of what selenium toxicity, and and will will manage this differential diagnosis list the same way we manage an ECG that says there's ST elevation. I'm like, I don't think so. Right, like 
do you get that every now and then? The machine is like, the machine says there's SK elevation. I'm like, I, I, I don't see it. It doesn't match the clinical presentation. And so you just put it aside. It gives you pause and you say, huh, could there be ST elevation? Do I need to back up and recheck here? And you sort of think and you, and you decide either you engage with this idea that perhaps there's a STEMI happening in front of you, or you say, no, this is not right. And I'm going to move on. So this is an assistant to your thinking. It is expanding your thinking. It's leveraging this massive tool to give you a differential diagnosis that you might not have been able to generate on your own. So I think that's super cool. This perspective uh, podcast is also linked in the reference list. It was from April, and it's a really interesting conversation about the role of AI and the idea that if you want to have good outcomes, you will start using AI in your, in your practice. So finally, uh, there's some evidence around prediction models. And this is another area where the generative AI is really performing in an interesting way. So what it's doing is it is watching the record. So it looks at the medical record. It looks at all the writing and entries in the record. It analyzes lab results and it analyzes vital signs in real time. And it is able with a pretty decent degree of accuracy to recognize when people go to the ICU or have a cardiac arrest. And so apparently the hit rate is about in the mid 30% range, which they say is about right. If it's 100%, it's missing some. And if it's one to 2%, then you're gonna get alarm fatigue and stop paying attention to it. So 30% is about where it's hitting and that seems like it's about right. So it's, a, it's an early warning system that's being deployed. And this is a systematic review that was looking at some of these prediction models and how they're functioning. I actually heard a radio interview just a couple of uh, weeks ago from on Canadian Public Radio with a guy from St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto, and they're using the tool for delirium prediction, and they've upped their delirium detection rate from 25 to 90 percent in the first 24 hours of admission. Again, just leveraging this kind of ability to, uh, to absorb and analyze large amounts of data. So it's pretty cool, and I think it's really exciting. There's a few challenges. So uh, privacy is an obvious challenge. Um, this idea of it making things up, it's called a hallucination. So it has hallucinations. It just makes stuff up sometimes. You ask it to do uh, a report, it will make up a reference that looks like a real reference, but you can't find it. So, so this hallucination thing is a problem. Uh, another problem is something called a black box. So it spits out its differential diagnosis, but it doesn't tell you how it got there. How did selenium poisoning even get on this list? What does it look like? I don't know. It just popped up here right under aortic aneurysm, selenium toxicity. No idea why. And so there are strategies to managing this. One of them is you can query the chat box to show its work. How did you get to selenium toxicity? You ask it and it will give you a little summary of that. But, but the black box has been a bit of a problem that people are struggling with. Probably the biggest problem of AI and one of the things that people are talking a lot about is something called concretion of bias. And this has to do with the fact that the AI is analyzing existing large data sets. And if the existing large data sets collect stories of patients being treated differently because of ethnicity, then the machine will learn that it needs to treat patients differently based on ethnicity and it will bake it into its algorithm. So because we have a problem of institutional and systemic racism, in our data sets, there is this worry about how we protect the AI algorithms from making erroneous assumptions based on racism being literally kind of baked into the program. So that's another issue that they are working on solving. So I don't, I, I mean, I'm obviously not an AI expert. I am really excited about the potential of AI to help us stop making diagnostic errors. I went online, I found a few online courses. Uh, they have varying degrees of price. <laughs> the Coursera one is Stanford, it's the cheapest, just FYI. <laughs> I'm thinking of taking one of these and, and I feel like forward thinking departments will skill up their people. And I think if I was training right now as a resident, I might look into doing something like this to get on top of this. Cause I, I have never seen anything like this AI explosion and I think it's coming really soon and it's gonna change our practice really soon. And with that, the, I, will, I will stop. The system interventions that we talked about are programmatic feedback and particularly using that SPADE methodology, care pathways with specialty support for particular uh, conditions that, that you may have institutional uh, weak spots around, 
And the ability to leverage technology, I think, is a really exciting innovation. There's my QR code and some of the summary. So I, I hope you've had a bit of a, an overview of, of diagnostic error from the, from the blue sky kind of level. And I'm happy to take some questions if people have any. Thank you. So my question is, for entities that don't have access to big data, how would they leverage AI for their um, communities and their smaller rural hospitals? I think the I think the answer to that is in a million different ways. And I think there are going to be probably in the near future a lot of commercially available products that leverage external data sets. So whether people are whether institutions are going to use their internal data sets or or have programs that have been trained on external data sets and continue to learn there, I, I'm not completely sure. It looks like Jim may have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, your, your talk was fantastic. Oh, thank you. And it, it, I actually wish um, you were going to come to our retreat because a lot of the things that you've talked about are going to be integrated into our, are going to be integrated within the retreat. And you know, the themes are wellness and practice integration with digital. Uh, there is a project which I hesitate to bring up to the group because people expect results right away. But in years from now, with ambient listening, yeah, and digital dictation. The issue is the amount of computing power you need costs millions and millions of dollars to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with exactly what you said. I love how you've worded it. And uh, I'll have to ask you for the exact quote about how AI is not going to replace us because there's definitely been a fear of that. But physicians who adopt AI and use it as sort of what I've been calling, if anyone's seen the uh, Marvel movies, Iron Man, Jarvis, who is support, mm -hmm. right? You know, you walk out of the room, initiate sepsis protocol, your orders are done. You adopt anything you need and mm -hmm. things that you want to take out. But um, that is that is eventually coming. It's going to take a lot of work to get there, but that, and there's a really good Harvard Business Review on use of AI. And the pathway forward is to alleviate pain points with it. And that has really been the thing that we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. It's harder to do than it looks. Yeah. Um, your comments on mindfulness are exactly true. I don't know if anybody remembers Luis Nero, who was our practice chair years ago. Um, he once gave a talk and said how in the middle of a horrible shift, he left and went into the dictation room, closed the door for like five minutes and just had to recollect themselves. Right. And that's always that's always left an impression on me because anyone who's been a consultant or a senior resident knows your name gets called literally probably 10 times a minute mm -hmm. on average. And the interruptions are so high. And, you know, the teamwork and cognitive pieces you're talking about are all very true. So I, 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 your talk was fantastic. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I completely agree, Dr. Coletti. Dr. Murray, that was a fantastic talk. It provides such a wide breadth of medical errors from a myriad of perspectives. Now it's on us to take the deep dives into this problem into the future so that we can find solutions and improvements from this shared foundation. For anyone who reaches out to connect speakers with learners, I again highly recommend that you ask Dr. Murray to be part of your speaker group. I have included all of her key references into the show notes so that you have access. To the listeners, thank you for tuning in. You are on Alex and my list of people we are most thankful for in our lives. We appreciate the gift that is your time and attention. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our show. And most importantly, tell a friend if you could, because word of mouth makes a huge impact. Come back December 1st for our next episode. And until then, be safe, be warm, be generous, be kind. The Always On EM Podcast. Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds. 